Hello everyone, uh, my name is Claire Mahaffey. I'm a professor of ocean sciences at the University of Liverpool. And today I'm going to talk to you about a project called Ziploc, um, specifically zinc, iron and phosphorus co-limitation in the ocean, and give you an idea about the insights that we've gained from proteomics. I'd first of all like to acknowledge the Ziploc team, including the principal investigators, PhD students, postdocs, and also international project partners. So this was a really nice um, synthesis of data that was published in uh, 2019 by Adam Martini et al, which shows the surface ocean concentration of phosphate globally. And these are from observations. And what we see is that there are uh, large ranges in surface ocean phosphate from almost zero up to about 250 to 300 nanomoles. However, what we see is there's large areas of the ocean, specifically the northern subtropical gyre of the North Atlantic, also the Mediterranean Sea, and also uh, the western subtropical North Pacific, where phosphate concentrations are chronically low. And in these regions, the productivity or certain processes are certainly constrained or limited by the avail availability of that phosphate. However, the thing that I'm most interested in is also thinking about the future projections of what phosphate might look like. It is predicted that the area of phosphate depletion will expand and also that the intensity of phosphate depletion will intensify in the future due to two specific reasons. First of all, there is increased nitrogen flux from the atmosphere to the ocean. And this is shown here in these uh, model outputs from 1850, 2005 and 2050, which shows the oxidized, oxidized nitrogen deposition to the surface ocean. And you can see that between 1850 and 2005, there is a significant amount of excess nitrogen going into the surface ocean. By 2050, it is predicted to reduce simply because of uh, better management of um, oxidized forms of nutrients being injected into the atmosphere. However, what this is doing is adding more nitrogen to the ocean without a simultaneous input of phos phosphorus. And what this will do is to force or increase the N to P ratio in the ocean and, in, and force the system towards phosphorus depletion. In addition, um, it has already been seen and is also predicted that uh, there will be increased stratification, especially in the warm subtropical gyres. So this is a map from a paper published by Lee et al. in 2020 that shows a property called the buoyancy frequency, which is a, a measure of stratification. And that's simply just the, um, it's based on the density difference between layers of 0 to 10 meters and 190 to 200 meters. And what you see here is the red are areas where there's increases in um, stratification. And what we're seeing here is there's increased stratification in the Pacific gyre, in the Atlantic gyre and also in the Indian Ocean. And indeed stratification has been predicted, sorry, has increased already by about 5.3% between 1960 and 2018. And indeed what the IPCC report uh, published in 2019, specifically on oceans and climate also has shown, is that it is predicted that um, surface ocean nutrients are predicted to decline in the future and also that will have an, uh, an effect on productivity, which is also predicted to decline in the future. And again, that's because of increase, increased stratification, which is predicted to intensify in the future, which will reduce the flux of nutrients to the surface ocean. And that will certainly have consequences for ocean productivity and also ecosystem function. So from a phosphorus perspective, it doesn't look very good in the future. It looks like the regions of phosphorus depletion will expand and the uh, degree of phosphorus depletion will also intensify. So what is it we need to know as scientists in order to better understand what could happen in the future? So I'm going to address some fairly simple but important questions. Uh, what phosphorus acquisition strategies are deployed by the dominant phytoplankton species in the contemporary phosphate deplete ocean? And the main species we're going to focus on are Prochlorococcus and Sinecococcus. And secondly, how important is phosphate versus organic phosphorus sources to meeting the phosphorus demand of these dominant phytoplankton species? So why is that important? Well, here we have profiles of phosphate in the white circles 
and dissolved organic phosphorus in the green circles. This, you can see in the surface ocean, phosphate concentrations are very low, whereas dissolved organic phosphorus concentrations are high. And that's because you have much higher dissolved organic phosphorus or DOP in surface relative to phosphate. And there's some of this pool of dissolved organic phosphorus, which is actually accessed by phytoplankton via hydrolytic enzymes. One of the best studies hydrolytic enzymes involving phosphorus metabolism is one called alkaline phosphatase, and that's what we'll focus on here. And in fact, in 2014, I did a synthesis of all of the data on alkaline phosphatase in the ocean, um, both in the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Mediterranean. And I looked at the relationship between phosphate here on the x-axis and alkaline phosphatase activity. Okay, so this is how fast that enzyme is working on the y-axis. And what you see is at high phosphate concentrations, you tend to have very low APA activity or alkaline phosphatase activity. And once I got to about 30 nanomolar of phosphate, there was a very large and uh, steep increase in alkaline phosphatase activity, meaning that at low phosphate concentrations, you tend to, tend to see organisms start to actually deploy alkaline phosphatase to meet their phosphorus demands. So alkaline phosphatase seems to be an important enzyme in, uh, ocean, in ocean regions in order for organisms to acquire phosphorus from the dissolved organic phosphorus pool, which in these gyre systems, there is plenty of. However, uh, the devil is in the detail. And actually, um, if we look at the alkaline phosphatases, and what we realize is these are actually called metalloenzymes. That is, they have a metal cofactor that makes them operational. And it just so happens that the metal cofactor for the most common, uh, common um, enzymes of alkaline phosphatase um, are FOA, which requires zinc, and FOX, which requires iron. So actually, these alkaline phosphatases, FOA and FOX, require a metal cofactor, zinc for FOA and iron for FOX, in order to be able to operate. And that leads to a really interesting problem is that not only do organisms need to get phosphorus, but also there is potential that actually they, uh, they also need metals in order to upregulate these hydrolytic enzymes in order to get phosphorus. So that then addresses, that then brings another question, what actually controls these alkaline phosphatases in the low nutrient environment? Is it simply just phosphate, as I showed in that 2014 study, where low phosphate uh, motivates high alkaline phosphatase activity? Or does iron and zinc have a role to play in actually adding the cofactor to FOA or FOX in order to then allow these um, metalloenzymes to function? So it's essentially asking, what is the relationship between alkaline phosphatases, phosphate, iron, and zinc? So to address this, and um, we had a project funded in 2017 called Ziploc, Zinc, Iron and Phosphate Co-Limitation in the Ocean. And that project involved a 42-day research cruise from Guadeloupe to Tenerife, crossing the North Atlantic Subtropical Gyre at around 20 degrees north. And that was on board the, the James Cook. And we had a number of stations along the way, a test station, Station 1, 1 1.5, and then stations two to seven. And mostly today I'll focus on stations two to seven when I show the station specific information. The reason for that is because stations one and two are actually heavily influenced by the Amazon and therefore are actually really anomalous compared to these other stations. Along the way, we also had a towed Teflon fish being towed behind the ship. And that actually meant that we could sample every two hours for the entire transect which means we have really high resolution data that actually allows us to see the gradients and key environmental variables. So as I said, we're going to focus on two specific dominant cyanobacteria that grow in these gyro systems, Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus. And first of all, I just want to talk about what their phosphorus acquisition strategies actually could be. So this is a really nice schematic from a paper by Lynn et al. in 2016 which shows all of the possible phosphorus acquisition pathways of a cell. And what we're going to focus on in this project is specifically looking at the uptake of phosphate 
by an enzyme called PSTS, which is a high affinity phosphate binding enzyme. And also we're going to focus on these alkaline phosphatases, which again are these metallo uh, metalloenzymes. And specifically, we're going to focus on FOA and FOX, where FOA requires zinc and FOX requires iron. And you'll see them written like this from now on. What we were able to do in collaboration um, with Noel Held and Max Sato at Woods Hole was to actually take a, um, an absolute quantification of these protein biomarkers. So we were able to look at the concentration of PSTS associated with Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus, and also the concentration of FOA and FOX also linked with these two species separately. The ship was also full of biogeochemists and trace metal scientists. So what we also have is lots of what I call states and rates. We have nanomolar phosphate concentrations, so getting down to the absolute lowest levels we can. We have dissolved iron, dissolved zinc, dissolved organic phosphorus concentrations, as well as the activity of alkaline phosphatase measured using a substrate called MUFP. So we have rates and states which actually then support the rest of this proteomic data. So as well as doing all these really um, uh, high level in situ experiments, what we also did was a series of nutrient amendment bioassays. And we did these in 22 and a half liter bottles, which we incubated in these large temperature controlled uh, vans um, on the ship under light controlled conditions. And what we did was we had a control and then we added zinc, iron, cobalt, nitrogen, uh, nitrogen and zinc, etc, etc, as well as dissolved organic phosphorus to really pull apart what actually controls the alkaline phosphatase activity uh, within the subtropical North Atlantic. And again, we conducted these experiments from all, at all stations, but I'll mostly show the data from stations two to seven. So all of these incubations were conducted in triplicate and also under trace metal clean conditions. And today I'll focus on showing you the results from the zinc additions, the iron additions, but also not combined with nitrogen, but combined with dissolved organic phosphorus. So essentially what we did was we added a, a cocktail of esters, these very labile organic phosphorus compounds, um, to see what effect that would have on alkaline phosphatase. So what I'll do briefly is just go over what the environment actually looked like. Okay, so this was a warm, stratified subtropical gyre system. And so here we have phosphorus, we have phosphate in blue and dissolved organic phosphorus in orange. What we see is that phosphate was less than 10 nanomolar in the west and around 30 nanomolar in the east, so very low phosphate concentrations. What we saw for dissolved organic phosphorus was this really nice west to east gradient where we have low phosphate, less than 100 nanomolar in the west, so in the Sargasso Sea, and an over 100 nanomolar of phosphate in the east. Here we have the uh, zonal transects of um, iron and also zinc. And again, this is the west, this is the east. So we have this strong west to east decline in iron from about 1.2 to 0.4 nanomolar. So 1.2 is a pretty high concentration of iron for these systems. However, for zinc, what we find is that zinc was really quite low, but also really quite variable across the transect. There is no clear west to east transect, uh, west to east trend in the zinc data. We also measured Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus in high resolution across this transect. So this is west and this is east. And what we see is for Prochlorococcus, the, uh, the abundance of Prochlorococcus was lower in the west and higher in the east, which was completely opposite to what we saw with Synecococcus, which was higher in the west and lower in the east. So actually Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus distributions almost opposed each other. So what did the alkaline phosphatase activity look like? Well, this is the alkaline phosphatase activity binned um, every degree. And again, this is the west, this is the east. And what we saw is there was a, an east-west trend where in the west we had higher alkaline phosphatase activity and in the east we had generally low alkaline phosphatase activity. So phosphatase activity generally doubled going from the east to the west. And this was also in line with, with dissolved organic phosphorus, which tended to be 
low in the west where alkaline phosphatase was high and high in the east where alkaline phosphatase was low. And this actually we've seen before again in the th synthesis study I did in 2014 where I equated uh, or I uh, looked at the relationship between dissolved organic phosphorus on the x-axis and alkaline phosphatase on the y-axis. And again, what you see is you have high alkaline phosphatase activity at low DOP and vice versa. So actually, um, what we're seeing here is that the high alkaline phosphatase activity is drawing down the DOP to low concentrations, whereas the low phosphorus dissolved organic, the low alkaline phosphatase activity is actually increasing DOP on this side, potentially. So now what I'm going to focus down in on is the proteomics, okay, and look at the distribution of the concentration of these different proteins um, that, um, that actually tell us something about the phosphorus acquisition strategies of prochlorococcus and synechococcus. And what I'll focus on specifically is the data, is the, uh, data from stations 2 over to 7. So all of these plots have 2 to 7, so this is the west and this is the east. So I'll start off with prochlorococcus, and here we have prochlorococcus for uh, the PSTS, that high affinity phosphate binding protein, for FOA, so that's the zinc requiring alkaline phosphatase, and the FOX, that's the iron requiring alkaline phosphatase. And you can see for some of them we have a number of different bars, and that's because we used a different peptide sequence to actually find that protein, which when they give a similar pattern, gives us more confidence in the data. So for prochlorococcus, what we see is there is very clear west to east gradients in both PSTS and also for FOA, where you have higher PSTS and FOA in the Western tropical Atlantic and lower PSTS and lower FOA in the Eastern subtropical Atlantic. And what this is essentially indicative of is that the prochlorococcus in the Western subtropical Atlantic are very much P stressed because of the very low phosphate concentrations that we saw there. However, when we look at FOX, we see that there's actually no strong zonal trend in FOX. Instead, what we see is that across all stations, it tends to be fairly low, except there is an increase in the FOX concentration at station three. And we've interrogated this station and there's no reason why it should be the phosphate is exactly the same as the neighbouring stations, and so is the iron concentrations. So what about the nutrient bioassays? So again, what I've shown here is the uh, protein concentration in the control, plus zinc, plus iron, plus zinc, plus esters, plus iron, plus esters, and esters only. And remember, in these sorts of incubations, we compare everything to the control. So what we are doing here is this line represents the control. So if the bar is above, it means there's an increase relative to the control. And if there's a bar below, it means there is a decrease relative to the control. And all these incubations were conducted for 48 hours. So what we see across the board is that there's no significant increase for prochlorococcus on either of the, on all of the enzymes after the addition of iron or zinc on its own. Instead, what we see is that both PSTS and FOA are actually suppressed significantly by the addition of dissolved organic phosphorus or dissolved organic phosphorus combined with metals. And FOX is actually stimulated by the addition of DOP. So immediately we see here that there's something is different, something is something different is controlling PSTS and FOA relative to FOX. So what we can conclude from this is that prochlorococcus are P-stressed in the Western Atlantic, causing them to produce both PSTS and FOA per cell compared to the Eastern Atlantic. We see that PSTS and FOA are suppressed under the addition of phosphorus. However, we also see no strong zonal trends in FOX, but FOX is actually stimulated by the addition of DOP. So what this really indicates is that the drivers and cellular mechanisms for FOX and FOA are different, okay, and that it calls into question their status as biomarkers for P stress, especially for FOX. Often in the literature, you'll see that FOX and FOA, their presence is a, used as an indicator for the nutrient stress. But what we see here is that while one is actually, by FOA, is actually suppressed by the addition of D, DOP, 
4X is actually stimulated by the addition of DOP. So we cannot interpret the presence of 4X and 4A in a similar manner. And I'll come back to that later. So what about Seneca caucus? So these are the zonal trends, again, going from west at station two to east at station seven for Seneca caucus PSTS, 4A and 4X. And there's, um, but what we see here is that the trends in PSTS and 4A are completely different. At, uh, for PSTS, it's high at two, low at three, and then de decreases gradually. Whereas for 4A, it's high at two, and then it's fairly low and decreases um, into the eastern tropical Atlantic. That was unlike Prochlorococcus, where the zonal patterns actually look really similar. For 4X, there is actually a, a clearer zonal trend almost, where you have low, if not any, 4X in the western subtropical Atlantic, and you see an increase in the 4X as we transect to the eastern subtropical Atlantic, specifically in Sinecococcus. And actually here, if you compare 4A and 4X, what you see is that 4A oh, uh, is higher in the West. Sorry, that's incorrect there. 4A is higher in the West, whereas 4X is higher in the East. So what about the protein biomarkers? So again, we have the control, zinc, iron, zinc and DOP, iron and DOP, and DOP on its own. And again, we're going to compare everything to the control where these lines represent the control. And what we see here is that PSTS and FOA actually increase after the addition of the metals, zinc and iron, but also after the addition of metals plus dissolved organic phosphorus. So in this case, unlike Prochlorococcus, there is a much clearer response to of Sinecococcus in terms of increasing these phosphorus acquisition enzymes. However, FOX really doesn't show a great deal, except there is a small increase in FOX after the addition of zinc plus phosphorus. So our conclusions for Sinecococcus are, first of all, that the P status is certainly less clear. We didn't see the uh, clear zonal trends in PSTS, FOA and FOX that we saw with Prochlorococcus. The, importantly, unlike Prochlorococcus, the zonal trends in PSTS and FOA are not similar. However, it was the addition of zinc, or zinc combined with DOP, or iron, and iron combined with DOP, stimulates the production of both PSTS and FOA, and that is also different to Prochlorococcus. We see that the zonal trends in FOA and FOX are opposite, with FOA being higher in the west and FOX being higher in the east. So for Sinecococcus, it appears that the metal availability as well as the DOP availability is important for its ability to cope under phosphorus stress. So that's an awful lot of information I've given you so far and an awful lot of uh, abbreviations, foes here and foes there. So let's go back to what our research questions actually are. So first of all, what phosphorus acquisition strategies are deployed by the dominant phytoplankton species in the contemporary phosphate deplete ocean? And how important is phosphate versus DOP um, to these plankton species? Well, what I've done here is assume that PSTS, FOA and FOX represent the majority of the phosphorus acquisition strategies used by Prochlorococcus and Sinecococcus. That's not quite true. They can use polyphosphates, phosphonates, but we'll just simplify things for now. Then what I did was I calculated the nitrogen content of each of these enzymes and then looked at the contribution of that nitrogen to the total phosphorus, phosphorus acquisition pool. And what that gives us is that along these transects, again, this is the west, this is the east, it gives us an idea about the importance or the relative contribution of PSTS in green, FOA in blue, and FOX in orange um, to the acquisition strategies. So what we see is that for Prochlorococcus here on the left, that PSTS, that high affinity phosphate binding protein, represents more than 83% of the phosphorus acquisition proteins, which means for Prochlorococcus, phosphate, phosphate uptake dominates relative to alkaline phosphatase activity. However, for Sinecococcus, what we see is that there's an array of different acquisition strategies. In the western subtropical Atlantic, where phosphate is really low, PSTS actually contributes more to the uh, enzyme pool, 
compared to when we get to the eastern subtropical Atlantic, we see that there's a transition to Fo A being dominant and then a transition to Fo X being dominant as well. So what we're seeing here is that uh, Seneca Caucus is actually deploying an array of acquisition strategies across the Atlantic. And that's actually really interesting because what it's showing us is phosphate dominance for Prochlorococcus, where Seneca Caucus actually tries to deploy lots, lots of different strategies. What we also wanted to ask is what controls alkaline phosphatases in the low nutrient ocean? Is it simply the phosphate concentration? Whereas I showed in that study in 2014, low phosphate means high alkaline phosphatase, or does iron or zinc have a role to play in controlling these enzymes? So let's have a look at, first of all, at the phosphorus control in alkaline phosphatase. What we see for prochlorococcus is that PSTS and FOA concentration are high in the phosphate deplete west and suppressed after DOP. Whereas for Sinecococcus, PSTS and FOA zonal gradients are unclear, but PSTS and FOA are actually stimulated by the addition of DOP and so is FOX. So that means in this case that actually uh, prochlorococcus are Prochlorococcus are actually affected or are suppressed um, under, uh, sorry, what that means is that um, under, pro, under phosphate limited conditions, Prochlorococcus are actually deploying PSTS and FOA, and once they're exposed to phosphorus, phosphorus decreases, whereas Sinecococcus is actually responding to the addition of phosphorus, specifically of DOP, by upregulating PSTS and FOA. So these prochlorococcus and senecococcus completely dominate the phytoplankton uh, within these uh, subtropical gyre systems. So it's really quite interesting that the control, whoop, the control of, um, on alkaline phosphatase appears to be really different. And so one of the things we wanted to kind of dig into a little bit is to think, well, why is that? Why is it that prochlorococcus, PSTS, and FOA are behaving very similarly and actually being suppressed by DOP? whereas PSTS and FOA are behaving differently and zonally, but are actually being stimulated by DOP. And actually what Noel Held has done was to dig into this data set a little bit more by looking at the gene neighborhood, basically saying, okay, where do these genes actually sit um, within the full regulon and therefore how are they controlled? So th this, is, uh, this is far from my area of expertise, but I'm going to try and work through this. Um, so basically what you see here is the position of these different proteins in the periplasm and the cytoplasm. And it tells us something about which enzymes work together to control phosphorus uptake. So if the enzymes are located close together, that means that they can be co-regulated, for example. Or if the enzymes are far apart or beside other metabolic enzymes, that means that they are regulated by something else. So for prochlorococcus, what Noel found is that FOA is located next to this FOBR, which is also located next to this PSTS. And therefore, that means that it's likely regulated by phosphate. However, FOX is actually far away from this FOR, FOBR, and therefore it is not regulated by phosphate, which is why within prochlorococcus, we see that um, FOA and PSTS behave similarly because they're located close together, whereas FOX is really far away. For Sinecococcus, the FOA and the FOX is actually located far away from FOBR. That means that neither FOA or FOX are regulated by the availability of phosphate within Sinecococcus. And instead, what she found was that FOA and FOX tend to be closer to sugar metabolism enzymes, or protein, sorry, uh, which means actually they may be regulated by carbon availability rather than phosphate availability, which is why they may have responded to the addition of dissolved organic phosphorus, which obviously contains organic carbon. So actually there is a cellular um, structural reason why these enzymes are behaving differently and are responding to in different environmental cues. Okay, so what about iron control? Okay, so we, uh, we know that FOX contains iron, so what we might expect to see here, and this is the gradient of iron, where we have high iron in the west and low iron in the east, 
what we might have expected to see is an organism would produce more FOX in an iron rich system and less FOX in an iron deplete system. However, what we did find is in the iron rich Atlantic, there is no relationship between FOX and iron. That is for both Prococcus and Sinecococcus. And in fact, Sinecococcus looks like it increases FOX as you go from west to east. Iron does not stimulate FOX production in bioassays. That is, when we add iron, there is no increase in the FOX either in Sinecococcus or Prochlorococcus. What about zinc control? Well, as I said, zinc concentrations are really variable between the Western and Eastern Atlantic. And indeed, there is no relationship between zinc and FOA. However, the addition of zinc stimulates FOA production in Sinecococcus, but not in Prochlorococcus. Okay, so zinc seems to have an effect on Sinecococcus, but not on Prochlorococcus. So the take home message here is that in the phosphate deplete iron rich subtropical North Atlantic, Sinecococcus produces metalloenzymes alongside phosphate acquisition proteins to, in order to reach its phosphorus demand, whereas Prochlorococcus mostly produces phosphate acquisition proteins, therefore Prochlorococcus seems to be more regulated by the availability of phosphate, whereas Sinecococcus seems to be deploying these different acquisition strategies to get phosphorus from different, source, from different sources. For Prochlorococcus, it's the phosphorus availability that places a really strong control on these phosphorus acquisition proteins, especially for PSTS and FOA, which are co-regulated within the uh, foregulon. But it seems that zinc and iron have absolutely no influence on PSTS, FOA, or FOX within Sinecococcus. That is, these enzymes do not seem to be limited by the availability of metals within Prochlorococcus. For Sinecococcus, it looks really different. We seem to be seeing some phosphorus, zinc, and iron control um, on both the in, in situ distribution of these proteins and also in the stimulation of these different proteins within the bioassays. So, what will, which species, therefore, will thrive under future ocean nutrient scenarios. We know that phosphate concentrations are going to decrease. We know that phosphate concentrations are going to decrease. And that would mean that Prochlorococcus is going to have to deploy more enzymes in order to be able to acquire its phosphorus. However, Sinecococcus seems to be able to use different strategies in order to get phosphorus. But the problem here is also re uh, relies on metals such as zinc and iron. And the concentrations of zinc and iron may also change in the future, depending, for example, on the dust supply, on also on the impact of ocean acidification on, um, on uh, iron on metal speciation, which actually affects its bioavailability. So this final slide is something I'd like to talk to you next Monday about. And that's about the kind of the caveats, challenges, or opportunities with doing these sorts of studies. My background is very much in marine biogeochemistry. I'm a nutrient person, an isotope person, a rates person, and an observational scientist. But what I realize is when you transfer your kind of um, thirst for understanding into the area of genes and proteins, what you end up with is actually a lot of uncertainties. Um, because the questions that we would want to address as a biogeochemist we can't quite address with some of the tools that I'm deploying here. So what I'd like to explain to you when we meet next Monday is um, these five kind of caveats uh, are challenges or opportunities, depending upon uh, your perspective on these things, um, uh, that, uh, that we have to consider as biogeochemists when we move forward with these kind of um, uh, coupled studies. Thank you very much for your time. and I look forward to meeting all of you next Monday. Thank you.